Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming back from lunch and not staying with the really delicious dessert. Uh, so give one more huge round of applause for the organizers and the really great food. Thank you. Yeah, I, I do love my stomach. But uh, now that every everybody's full, I hope you're ready to talk about something exotic, about cross-site scripting. Uh, like I said, thank you for the introduction. My name is Benedek Gagyi. Uh, this is my Twitter handle. Or this is my Twitter handle. Uh, I posted these slides there, so if you prefer to follow along on your own device, you can do that. So, what's up with security? I mean, it's a really strange topic because if your only source of information is from Hollywood movies, then you might have a really strange idea about like how, how this cyber security thing is working. Like, usually there are two kinds of movies. You're either uh, rooting for the hacker, like uh, the movie called uh, Hackers with Angelina Jolie, where the main uh, protagonist is a hacker who can hack into anything and he's like basically, he or she is basically unstoppable. Or you have a person trying to defend against the evil hackers and these people usually will do anything to stop these attacks. For example, in Die Hard 4, Bruce Willis actually rams a police car into a helicopter mid-air just to stop the hackers. Or even better, or even better, in the last uh, Fast and the Furious movie, the good guys stop the evil hackers by attacking a frigging submarine with cars. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes no sense, I know. Uh, and I don't know about you, but it would scare the hell out of me if I had to like ride a car on ice and fight a, a submarine. But if we come back to reality, I think, uh, the whole uh, eco ecosystem with talks and uh, uh, books and uh, blog posts is sometimes a bit scary too. So I'm a regular web, web developer. Uh, I try to juggle all the topics that we here uh, talked about yesterday and today. Like uh, Jen talked about uh, accessibility. Yeah, I have to juggle that. Alex talked about performance. Yeah, we have to take care of that. Glav and uh, Katie talked about testing. Yeah, you have to know about that too. So with all these things in mind, you can't really be a security expert, but if like an article is aimed at security experts, then it's, it's kind of a bit of a scary. So I, as much as I'd love to be, I, I'm not uh, Angelina Jolie uh, carelessly uh, skating around the city with cool inline skates and hacking anything, and I'm also not Bruce Willis. I'm not going to jump out of a building just to stop a hacker attack. Uh, if we continue with the movies analogy, I'm basically the guy sitting in the seventh row eating some popcorn, trying to enjoy the movie. Uh, so I think we need a third kind of uh, category because usually we have like black hat hackers and white hat hackers. So I'm proposing a third one and uh, I'm calling it just enjoy the show and try to learn from it hat. Yeah, I know it doesn't really make much sense. It's just basically a joke. But uh, I'm really, really con convinced, like 100% convinced that you don't have to be an expert to be able to enjoy something. And if all these articles and everything is aimed at experts, that doesn't mean that you can't find something interesting, something beautiful, something creative in it. So to give you an example, like Nya said, I drink a lot of tea. And uh, when I first heard about this kind of tea called puer, I was like, what is this thing? Is this like a bird's nest or something? But then um, I started digging into it, trying a bit more, drinking a bit more of it. And with just a bit of effort, I uh, reached a level where I can actually appreciate the small nuances, the small details that made, make it actually the most liked uh, kind of tea in China. And uh, I think the same goes for, for us web developers. We have the knowledge about JavaScript, about the browsers, about web development in general. And if we add just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of uh, security-related stuff, that will be enough to reach a level where, okay, you're not Angela Najoli, but still, you're good enough to understand what's going on, and what's even more important, you're, you know enough to appreciate the beauty of all these things. My goal with this talk in, uh, is, is basically double-fold. The first thing is I'd like you all to show a few um, extra ways you can do XSS, but the more important goal for me is to show you how nice, how beautiful, how creative uh, these things can be. And maybe, just maybe, if you see this beauty, you, it will be a slightly more easier for you to get into security, if you're interested. So let's talk about XSS. You can't really do that without mentioning Sammy. In 2005, uh, this beautiful person ex executed the first XSS attack on MySpace. 
he basically posted um, a malicious script on his site. So if somebody visited uh, their MySpace, Sammy's MySpace, MySpace profile, uh, they would first uh, add an extra sentence to their own profile saying that, but most of all, Sammy is my hero, and they would also copy the malicious script. So they call this a worm, and, and it, it spreads super fast. In just 20 hours, not even a day, one million people's profiles were affected. That, that's, that's pretty cool. What's not cool is, though, that Sammy actually had to uh, stand in front of a um, jury and had to endure trial, and he was sentenced for three years. He wasn't allowed to use uh, internet at all. So that's, that's pretty bad. Uh, but anyway, the, the kind of attack he executed, and basically this is what most people think about when you mention cross-site scripting, has the following flow. An attacker creates a malicious script, somehow injects it into a site, usually uh, using an input field or something, and then that's sent to the server, and the server saves this malicious script. And then somebody else comes, loads that site, and with the site comes the malicious script, and that's executed on the victim's computer. So the attacker writes the script, saves it on the server, and uh, the, it's run uh, on the victim's computer. So basically, that's it. Thank you for coming my, to my talk. See you all at the uh, after party. Yeah, this is actually, this is where, uh, what most people know, and it's, it's cool. If you know this much about XSS, you're better than, I think, 80% of web developers, but still, I think this is just where the rabbit hole starts, so let's dive right into it. Uh, there are many ways to classify uh, XSS attacks, and I really like this two-dimensional thing where uh, the attack I just told you about is considered stored and non dumb based Okay, but what are the other possibilities? Let's see, let's talk about reflected XSS. This is similar, but with a key difference. Imagine you have uh, a URL, for example, for a bank or anything, where, at the end of it, you have a URL parameter where you ex expect a name or something simple. And the value of this parameter will be rendered into the site. What happens if instead of a name, instead of putting there ban, I put a malicious script? If there's no sanitization, it will be actually rendered into the page for a victim. So in this case, the attack flow is slightly different. The malicious um, script is again written by the attacker, but then it's not sent to the server, it's put into a URL, it's basically a link, and then it's sent to the victim. So if the victim clicks on this link, uh, they will request, uh, they send a request to the server, but this request will contain the, the malicious script, and if it's a server-side rendered app, the server will render the attacker script into the site, so when it's downloaded back from the URL where it was harmless, it becomes part of the page, and it runs, and bad things happen. So you see the main difference. In, in, uh, in um, stored XSS, the, the, the malicious code is stored in the server, and on reflected, it's, it's actually sent through a link. Uh, so these are the two kinds uh, in a horizontal way. The vertical way is also kind of interesting, but I, wouldn't, I don't really want to go into too much detail right now because uh, it's not that important uh, for our topic. Basically, you can have non dumb based and dumb based attacks, which, uh, if you want to simplify it, are server-rendered and browser-rendered. So the example I just told you is a server-rendered example, but if um, that parameter is not sent as a request uh, parameter, but uh, more like a part of a fragment, for example, so it doesn't even travel to the server, the JavaScript uh, inside the page can still take, a, take something from the URL and then render it to the page, making it actually run and becoming harmful. Okay. Uh, so what you learned uh, until now is that uh, drugs, I mean inputs, user inputs, are, are bad. They are really scary. So we, we have to do something about them, because if the user is allowed to input anything they want, then somebody will probably try something nasty. So where should we sanitize the inputs? Basically, we have three options. Either on client side before sending it, on server, or client side when it arrives. Of course, the first one is kind of out of the question, because it's really easy to circumvent, like, client size sanitization, and uh, the attacker will be able to send the script anyway. So we have two options, uh, the server or the, the browser, the client side. The problem is that browsers are pretty weird. I mean, super weird. It's really hard to tell if you just look at a piece of HTML code what the browser will actually render. So let's take an example. 
we have an invalid HTML. It's, it's invalid. But as you know, browsers will, uh, even if you send them something invalid, they will try to figure out what you meant and will try to come up with a solution. So if you have a div tag, and inside it you have a script tag that has an attribute called title, and inside that title, as a string, there's a closing div tag, what will happen then? Well, the browser will try to figure out what you wanted, and it will render first a div tag, and inside that, a script tag with a title that has a sc uh, um, string in it, that's the closing div tag, and because you, we, because you omitted them, he's like, I got you, fam, and we'll add script, the, the closing script tag and the closing div tag too. Okay, let's see another example. What if we switch those two? So we have a script tag outside and inside the div tag with a title and, um, again, uh, quotes and a closing script tag. So if it works the same way, then we should have something uh, similar to the first example, but we don't. We'll render, we get a script tag, inside of it a string, a closing script tag, and then at the end, just a parenthesis. Why does that happen? It happens because when the browser sees a, a, a div tag, it expects that inside of it will come another HTML element. But when it sees an opening script tag, it expects JavaScript and tries to parse everything it's inside until the, the closing script tag as JavaScript. This example will obviously throw an error but you, you see where we're, where we're heading here, right? On the server, you can't really do sanitization because you have no idea what the browser will actually do with your thing. It changes it, it mutates it. And that's where the name of this attack comes from. Mutation XSS or MXSS. These are the kind of attacks when we seem, send something seemingly harmless, but the browser adds a bit of magic and changes it, and then it becomes harmful. So how do you defend against this? Well, one, you have to do it on the client side, that's for sure, because on the server you have no way of telling what will happen. So you, you, have to, you actually need the help of the browser. So you could, what you could do is create a div element with document.create element, and then set the inner HTML with the questionable content. In our case, this is an image with an invalid source and an owner attribute that has a malicious script inside it. So if you do it like this, using a div element, you have a problem, because with div elements uh, do the following things. They parse the string and then immediately interpret it. So if you do it like this and you have a, an input like, like I have in, in the example with the malicious image, it will get executed immediate or interpreted immediately and the malicious script is executed. So we need something, and here I'm going to code the documentation, we need something that is a mechanism for holding HTML that is not to be rendered immediately when a page is loaded, but may be instantiated subsequently. We do have a, a, a tag uh, like that, and it's called template. Has anybody ever used the template tag? Oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Before uh, learning about this, I haven't used it at all. So the cool thing about the template tag is, like the documentation says, that if at, at first it doesn't, um, it parses it, but doesn't interpret it. So in this case, you can actually do without any worry uh, set the inner HTML with the questionable string, and then, because then it's actually like a DOM object, you can just go through it and remove the attributes that are unwanted with the remove attribute uh, function. In our case, with malicious uh, images, for example, it's a really good idea to remove on error and all the on um, things. Uh, you can do a blacklist approach, a whitelist approach, it depends on the context. The idea is that you can clean it, and that's fine. And this is a really good way to defend against these kinds of attacks. Or is it? In April uh, this year, the Google search, the actual search bar, was found uh, vulnerable to a kind of XSS attack, an MXSS attack. It was found by a Japanese XSS re researcher whose name I'm not able to pronounce, but he's, he's great. Just, just give it a Google search and his name will come up. So how did this work? And it, it, just a fun fact, it was out for three months. So for three months, Basically, the most visited page on the Earth was, success, was uh, vulnerable uh, for XSS attacks. That's <laughs> kind of scary. Uh, so what happened here? They used this really short um, uh, attacking payload. It's a, it's a no script tag opening. Then we have a P inside with a title that contains a closing no script tag and then an image inside. It's kind of similar to the things we looked at before. You, you, it's clearly... Uh, not 
correct HTML, so the browser will try to figure something out. No worries, we have a mechanism for that. We just use the template tag. So if we take a template tag, set the inner HTML with this payload, this is what will be rendered. An opening no script tag, and inside it a P tag, and inside the P tag's title attribute, the strings that we provided earlier, and because it's a string, it's harmless, it won't execute, everything is fine, we can render this. The problem is that if you take this inner HTML and give it to a div, it will render something different. It will actually render a no script tag with a P tag inside, and then it closes the no script tag and opens the image tag, which was before inside the title attribute, but now it's out in the wild, and if it's out in the wild, it gets executed, so again, bad things will happen. Why is this? So I actually saw that, okay, it, it's probably about the no script tag. So I went on the uh, documentation page, I think I read it three times before I actually found the relevant information. You can guess where it was. It was in the frigging first line. <laughs> so basically what it says that the no script tag represents nothing if scripting is enabled and represents its children if scripting is disabled. The problem is in template tags, scripting is disabled by default, and in div tags, scripting is enabled. That's why there's a difference. I think this is pretty cool and pretty interesting, and it shows you how you can take really simple things that you may already know about that are harmless by themselves, combine them, and have something super scary and super interesting. Okay, but what happens if you're simply not able to inject uh, a script. Like, we talked about those four ways and stuff like that, but all of these, like, require you to be able to inject, like, a script tag or, or some kind of JavaScript. No worries, you can still do XSS. Uh, you can inject CSS. So, let's say that you're able to inject one single line of CSS into a page, that, and everybody else who views it will also have that CSS line. Well, you can turn the... Um, uh, background color to something ugly, and you'll be like a super hacker, but you can do something even more interesting. You can just set the background image to a URL that you control, and that's it. Okay, that's, that's boring. It will download an image, or if you don't have an image at that URL, it will throw an error. Why is that interesting? Well, the thing is that your server will get a request from that user, and with that request, some extra information is coming. All of your requests contain PII information, personally identifiable information, like the IP address, the OS you're using, the browser, and these things are valuable. It's, it doesn't mean that if I manage to inject this, I can execute code on your computer, not yet, but I get information about your users, and I can use that later to construct uh, a more complicated and more malicious attack. So, yeah, even, even such a short, simple thing can be super dangerous. But let's get more deeper. If you're able to actually inject not only a CSS rule, but a selector too, you can do some really interesting tough stuff with um, um, pseudo selectors. For example, the checked pseudo selector checks if uh, a given checkbox was uh, checked or not. Yeah, I said checked like 10 times, sorry. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, if there's like a really important checkbox somewhere on the page, for example, the two-factor authentication checkbox, you can turn it on and off, you write a, a selector like this, and you add the specific background uh, URL where you add as a parameter that no 2FA equals true. Basically, you tell your own site that, hey, this user has the 2FA turned off. Again, you can select between the victims uh, as an attacker, and that's, again, a, a huge helping hand, a huge step forward. Another thing you can do is use the visited uh, pseudo selector this way, you can uh, learn what the users did uh, before on the respective page. And a really simple example would be checking if they read the um, uh, security tips. So you can send yourself, hey, this, this user is un, uh, un, uh, uneducated about security. I can try really simple tricks with them. And the list goes on and on. You get the idea. With these pseudo selectors, you can uh, do a kind of user behavior tracking and narrow down your attacking scope. Basically figure out who's the weakest link in the chain. Uh, another thing you can do is use attribute selectors. Basically, if there's like a, a drop-down, you can actually um, write a selector for a given value. Obviously, if the users can enter anything, you can't really write a selector for, for every possibility. But if 
there's a specific page where there's a really important drop down with I don't know, five or ten or one hundred possibilities, you can generate uh, CSS that covers all the possibilities and then you figure out where they said their super secret meeting location with the drop, drop down box. Actually, uh, to go even further with the attribute selectors, I don't know if you uh, ever realized this, but in React, if you have a password field, it, it has a lot of extra attributes that React adds. But there's a funny one called value, where it actually puts the password that you entered in plain text. So using the attribute selectors and some extra things, and this is kind of too complicated to, to, to go into too much detail, but basically you can write a uh, keylogger using only CSS. How hardcore is that? I think it's super crazy. Uh, if you're interested in that, just Google it, because like I said, it's, it's kind of complicated uh, how you need a lot of things going your way to be able to execute it, but the thing is that it's possible. Uh, yeah, and of course, you can do data scraping with that too. Uh, so what happens if you can't uh, inject CSS? You can st still try to inject HTML. By injecting pure HTML, you can still wreak havoc. Uh, one thing you can do is inject a form, um, form tag and set the action so it uh, will work as an on-site request forgery, which is a version of cross-site script, cross, uh, CSERF, cross-site request forgery. Yeah, sorry, too many abbreviations. Uh, anyway, these are like, sound super scary, but they actually simple. Imagine that you have, um, uh, for example, a bank site where among the many API endpoints, you have one where you just say send money and add two parameters, how much and to which account. And if you manage to inject this form into a, log into a site and somebody who's logged in comes and clicks on the button, then they will send a request with these parameters their authentication. So if I'm clicking on this, I'm using my own account to execute, uh, the, to call this API endpoint, which will use my funds to send money to an account that was set previously, which is basically the attacker's account. So even with the form tag, you are able to do pretty nasty things. And last but not least, as a general idea, Beware of images. And I don't only mean like really bad memes on 9gag. Beware of like uploading images and stuff like that on your site because it's really easy to get it wrong. Again, we had this example a few times already, an image with an invalid source and an on error attribute that says, that contains a malicious script. Uh, but this is kind of, uh, kind of easy to avoid if you only let your users uh, uh, upload the source part and not anything else. There are a few methods to get out of that string and add extra attributes, but they are also kind of easy to defend. But even if you're, the attackers has, can do only one thing, just add the, something to the source tag, even then can, they can do nasty things. For example, uh, they may add uh, a Facebook link. Why would they add something from Facebook? Well, if you look, uh, when if you're, we go more further, this is not just a simple Facebook link. This is a Facebook tracking pixel that people usually use on their own site to learn more about their users. But if I set uh, the ID to my own Facebook uh, tracking account, then I will learn e everything Facebook knows about your users from your side to Facebook. And the thing is that uh, CSP won't help you here. So CSP uh, content security policy is a way to tell your site and your browser, okay, this site is allowed to open links only using these URLs. Uh, but if you, you yourself use Facebook tracking, then adding this kind of, uh, this kind of an image won't be stopped by, um, uh, by the CSP rules. So yeah, that's, that's again pretty scary and you, it's really easy to give away data about uh, your users. Uh, and the last uh, thing with images is basically combining uh, what we did with the form tag with an image. So we have a source where it's, um, again, uh, a request to your own bank, uh, sending money with a given amount with, to a given account is the same idea, just with the image. Again, we didn't do anything. The only thing we did was just add an image source. It could be like, I don't know, google.com slash kittens 
JPEG, or it could be something as harmful as this. So these things are really, really, really hard to uh, get right, but also uh, I'd like to, you to stop for a second and appreciate the creativity behind all these kinds of attacks. I didn't come up with any of these. These are like been around for forever, for like, so they are on the internet. It's really hard to track who came up with uh, a specific attack, but I really, really like the creativity behind them and the ingenuity. And uh, up until now, we were always talking about situations where it was really clear where the user can enter something and where these malicious scripts can come in, like an input field, upload your profile picture, stuff like that. But I'd like you to, to, to stop and think for a second, what do we consider user input? Basically anything that comes from the user's computer, because anything can be manipulated. I'll give you an example. You're a big company, you have this huge application, a lot of people use it, and you start to wonder, okay, I have this Google Analytics and Facebook tracking and stuff like that, but maybe I don't wanna use that. I, I wanna use my own because my users don't like Google and don't like Facebook. So you build like an internal app, it can be viewed only uh, for uh, insiders in your company, and what you're doing is basically checking the uh, user agents to see like what kind of browsers your users are using and the, the IP, so where they are from. Are these user inputs? Yes, they are. If you take like a, 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 um, an app like Postman or just like create your own request with a CRL, you can basically say that, yeah, my user agent is a script tag with a malicious script inside it. And because it's a, an internal app, it's usually not defended. Like, come on, like somebody from the outside can't access it. So the malicious script comes inside, and when you visualize, okay, uh, what kind of browsers are my users using, you see that, uh-oh, a script was executed. That's why it's called blind XSS, because as an attacker, you're sending these data in. You have no idea where it will be executed, but you, if you construct your um, uh, script right, you'll get a notification that, uh-oh, somebody opened the page where my payload was present. So this is really nasty, and I think it teaches a really good lesson that e even if something is not user-facing, even if uh, an application is internal, it doesn't mean that it's not attackable. Even then, uh, malicious actors can attack it. So, uh, like I said, my goal here was to show how nice these things can be, how creative this whole field is, but you can't really have like a security related talk without at least having a few words about like defense, like what you should do to avoid being hacked with these uh, approaches. So this is the TLDR of that, like really short. First, validate, validate and sanitize input. There are many tools for this. You don't have to write your own. You saw the basic idea behind it, but I highly recommend that you don't start, start coming up with your own thing because generally that's not a good idea. Also, like I said, beware of images. It's really, really hard to get it right. In my opinion, the only kind of secure way to have like an image upload form on your page is to basically get the image as uh, an image data and store it on your own server. And any time when you let somebody else provide them a link and then you put it in your page, you're opening some kind of attack vector. Also, like I said, don't try to be smart. Don't come up with your own things. Use the uh, established stuff. And use the frameworks. The frameworks we use today, like Angular, React, Vue, they are really, really good at sanitizing uh, uh, output. Uh, so usually you don't even need to care about that stuff because if you just like, you're not using something explicitly like dangerously set in our HTML, then you, you're probably out of the woods and you don't need to care about attacks. But it, frameworks are not invincible too. Sometimes they have bugs, sometimes they introduce uh, vulnerabilities. It's really important to always update them, try to stay with the current one. And this is actually a really good excuse. So if, if you wanna try the hot new React feature and your boss is like, hey, but why do we need that? You can say that for security. Please, please, please don't use that, please don't use that. Uh, and also, uh, sometimes third-party libraries, uh, they don't even, they can be on the server or some, somewhere else. Sometimes they introduce vulnerabilities, not only XSS, but some other stuff. So try to stay up to date, try to pay attention, use NPM audit or the GitHub stuff or Snake or any, there are many services for this. So with that being said, uh, I really wish for you to stay safe, but I beg you, please, don't forget to have fun while you're staying safe. And don't forget to, even if you read about some really scary hack, 
don't forget to appreciate the beauty be behind it because finding the beauty is the best way to actually start a journey and becoming an expert in something. Thank you very much for having me.